Hi, this is Mark Thompson, and you are listening to WSTR, Galactic Public Access. It's a Star Wars podcast, part of the Red Five Network. Mother will be so pleased. This podcast is a member of the Red Five Network. For more Red Five Network podcasts and content creators, visit bio.link slash red5. Wait, there's something very weak coming through. A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away... Hello, fellow Galactic listeners, I'm Aaron Hoolian, and this is WSTR Galactic Public Access, a Star Wars podcast. Welcome to episode 313. We hope you are what you and yours are well, and with everything crazy going on, we want to continue to be a platform that promotes positivity, life, and hope. And a little Star Wars along the way. Today, we're going to be catching up with friend of the show and voice actor extraordinaire Mark Thompson. Welcome back to the show. Hey, thanks so much. Excited to be here. Likewise. And uh, before we dive into all of Mark's amazing performances, let's see who we got here. Miss Carla Giacalone. Welcome back. Hello, everybody. Very excited to be here tonight. Yeah, nice to have you around. Uh, Todd, unfortunately, has the night off. So, Carla, it falls to you to tease that news. Certainly. Okay. so I've got first one is 20 years in the making. Quite a, quite a bit of time. That's pretty big. Uh, second one is I'm out. I'm out. Oh no. <laughs> and number three, to me, she is royalty, and I feel like I know what that one might be about. So. <laughs> Who could it be? Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Without any further ado, let's go ahead and jump into our main topic. And now okay. for our feature presentation. Okay. So. Rewinding the clock. I don't know why you would rewind the clock. Re- <laughs> rewind the VHS tapes. Uh, we go back to episode 142, which was Mark's first appearance on our show. September 2019, we talked about how he got started in voice acting. Consider that like an origin story, if you will. Mm, yes. And then uh, episode 177, that was June of 2020. What a wonderful time that was. We yeah. talked about fatherhood, Clone Wars. The Mandalorian and Rise of Skywalker book. Then jump ahead to episode 196 uh, in October of that same year. We discussed the Dr. Aphra audiobook and Thrawn Ascendancy. Wow. And now, uh, oh, I, I skipped one. Episode 231 in July of 2021, we discussed Thrawn, Greater Good. So now... In 2023, you are long overdue for an appearance, so it's been great to have you back. Um, so let's get caught up on you, your life, your recent work. How are you doing? What's new? Oh, wow. Uh, I didn't realize I've been on that often. That's pretty cool. Um, yeah. Uh, doing pretty good. Uh, we're we're kind of chugging along. Uh, my kids are old now, which is very weird for me. <laughs> so <laughs> my... Uh, oldest is out of the house and my youngest is about to leave the house and uh and uh start school and uh, so we're going to be empty nesters soon except for our dogs so that that's kind of a new phase of life wow. and uh mm-hmm. kind of getting used to that and stuff like that um and you know uh, still doing whatever audiobooks they'll let me do and uh lots mm-hmm. of animation and I've actually been starting to do uh, a lot more convention appearances, um, uh, mainly for my animation work, but it's always fun to meet some Star Wars fans uh, at those as well. So, how cool! Yeah, uh, we're going to touch on animation in a sec, um, but yeah, what it, what is that like uh, facing facing the specter of an empty nest soon? What are you going to do with your time? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know. It's really weird. Like, uh, I, I guess I do. I do have grand plans to kind of build a proper studio and like, you know, have, have actual like soundproofing and things like that. So that, that'll be a big project. Um, but it's, it's very, very weird. I, there's, I, I guess if I'm being brutally honest, I don't like it. Like I, 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 uh, I, I, I know it's part of life and they need to grow up and they need to kind of, you know, leave the nest and find their way. But I, I, 
I miss the, you know, everybody being together and hanging out and, you know, movie nights and all that stuff. And so, mm-hmm. uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a little, uh, lost at sea, I guess. <laughs> so, but my wife and I yeah, will have, you know, tough. more time to do fun things together so that like, you know, we'll, we're going to, you know, we're getting into paddle boarding and things like that. So we're, we're finding other things to do, but, uh, it's, it's, I, I, I feel, uh, a little queasy about it. Like, I don't like it. <laughs> I want to go to the, the world between worlds and go through one of those portals and, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> understandable yeah yeah that's tough but uh sounds like you're gonna try to make the most of it yeah no it'll be great new adventures awesome maybe one day you'll be the the voice of obi-wan in their heads yeah the that, that, that's the hope <laughs> <laughs> instead of like be quiet dad leave us alone <laughs> stop haunting us yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, let's get caught up on some of your recent work. Uh, so, Star Wars Visions. Yeah. Where the hell did that come from? Uh, uh, that came out in uh, <laughs> September of 2021. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, your roots have been animation. So, tell us about it. How does it, how does it feel to be in a Star Wars animation project? Uh, that was definitely a dream come true. Like, it, it was so amazing and just, like, I was super pumped. And um, it was basically... Um, a buddy of mine, uh, Mike Center Nicholas, uh, owns a audio studio called NYEV Post, and uh, it was one of the studios that got tapped to kind of do some of the English dub. Um, and he knew what a diehard Star Wars fan I was, and uh, he was like, you know, I, I have something, but I can't tell you what it is. But <laughs> you know, like, do you? Um, I think you're gonna really like it. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so like, he kind of pulled me in and uh, told me what it was. And I, you know, I had. I, I knew they had announced Star Wars Visions and the studios had been working on it. So I was, you know, very excited about it just as a fan. And then uh, when I when he called me and kind of let me know there's there's some bit parts here that, you know, I, it'd be great if you could jump in. I was like, yes, yes, please. Yes. <laughs> so he brought me in and uh, I did uh, Lan, who's like the three headed drummer in Tatooine Rhapsody, which I really loved, you know, because the animation style was very similar to uh, the way like Pokemon looks. So it felt like a kind of interesting blending of my worlds, uh, you know, so to be a part yeah. of that. Um, and then, and then uh, I, I did some ancillary characters and like the twins and things like that, like some stormtroopers and stuff. And, uh, but he like, you know, we did, we did my parts, but then like, he was like, do you want to see the whole thing? I was like, yeah. <laughs> so like, he like, let me like watch <laughs> the whole episode and like, and then we watched um, the, what was the one with the, with David Harbor and, um, uh, I was like the old Sith guy on the planet and like, but we watched, he, I got to watch that one. Oh, yeah. they were, they were that, it was up on the dock when they were recording it. So I was like, I think that I was, was like the master out. or something. Yes, 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 oh, yes. Oh yeah, yeah. 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 So, so yeah, it was just awesome. Like I, you know, I, I, I was, that, that's one of the things I was hoping to get to do one day and I'd, I'd love to do more of it one day, but uh, it was, it was so fun. It was definitely an answered prayer. It was really cool. Awesome. About how long did it take for each episode to record and get through it? My parts were pretty small. So like maybe like a couple hours. Cause like we, we, we kind of padded some of the, the chanting and stuff and, mm-hmm. and uh, the songs. Um, It was, it was interesting though. Like um, for the Tatooine Rhapsody one we did, um, you know, we did all, all my lines and kind of got it done an hour or two, but then like a couple of weeks later, they had to call me back in and we had to kind of redo some of the songs because Joseph Gordon Levitt, like uh, I guess like improvised a couple of lines on the song to try to make it a little, he felt like it was not quite getting adapted like art- accurately to what they were doing in the, in the Japanese. And he wanted to make it more authentic or more, you know, uh, hmm. sound better or something. So he, he improvised some lines. So it kind of changed what, you know, the rest of the band had to come back and say, so we had to come back and like redo the song. So it was really cool. So <laughs> Um, hmm. so this is fun. Awesome. Nice. Have you dubbed, uh, like anime or, uh, Japanese animation before? Yeah. Yeah. Like that's, um, kind of, a one of my bread and butter jobs is, uh, is, is doing that. Like I, I, um, way before I started doing narration and audiobooks, I was dubbing like Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh, um, and, uh, and, uh, there was a show called ultimate muscle and uh, I did a season of one piece before when it was at a different studio. And uh, so I, I did a, a ton of 
dubbing. And so I was, I was kind of very accustomed to that. And um, it's an interesting thing because like you, you, you're trying to kind of uh, match the emotion of the animation and kind of the, the, you know, translated, you know, version of what they say, but oftentimes the syllables don't exactly line up. So oftentimes you do have to kind of slightly change the wording or slightly change the cadence from how you might normally say it. If we were just having a normal conversation, you know, you might like normal conversation, you know, like you might have to like kind of say it slightly different to match the lip flap. Yeah. And so you kind of, you know, over the years kind of develop a couple of skills and little tricks of the trade to kind of, you know, figure out how to rewrite things in a, in a certain way, just to make it match a little bit better. And uh, so, yeah, but it's, it's super fun. Yeah. Cause like you have your line and it's got to have like, it's got to fit within a defined start and end point, but also the syllables have to land on different points within that space. Yeah. That you, it normally would not happen. Right. And, and oftentimes if you, you know, j just, a uh, the, the adaptation of translation of what it is in, in Japanese might have many more syllables than how you would say it in English. So like, like, so you might have to add it a, a couple other words or pad it or, or sometimes less words mm -hmm. to, to make the, you know, what it's saying makes sense with the lip flap. And, and then sometimes the script adapter is adapting it a certain way and, and kind of trying to adjust to the syllables the way they're kind of saying it in their mind. But if you pick a character that speaks with a little bit more of a laid back attitude, you might have to adapt it even more on the fly to kind of match the cadence that the performer's doing. So like there's, mm -hmm. or if you, or, or if the character you're, you're doing is more frenetic and a quick talker, then you have to like maybe, you know, pad it with some more words. And so there's, there's all kinds of like kind of on the fly things you sometimes have to do to try to make it, you know, really work. So that's why it, it happened with Joseph Gordon-Levitt, where he exactly. kind of like improvised a few lines and suddenly, oh, the backup vocals have to match that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Gotcha. That makes sense. What was the feeling like when you got to see like the final project altogether? I'm sure you saw it in some way. Right. Um, you know, it, it, right at the booth of the day but was it was it kind of different seeing it all together uh when it was finally streaming oh yeah it was it was amazing <laughs> it's you know you like seeing the whole disney plus and you know the you know the little uh logo and everything and uh i i i think i i i took a picture of the credits because like seeing my name in like the light blue letters on the star field was like a really big deal for me i was like oh my gosh <laughs> you know so that was that was really cool um and, and, you know, I, they had, you know, they were laying on with the merch. So like I bought like a, a star Wars, um, that they actually, somebody made a t-shirt of the band from Tatooine Rhapsody. It's a star waiver, I believe. And it had, it had all the, our characters on it, my characters on the shirt. So I went out and bought that shirt. And then there was like star Wars vision socks. And like, you know, it had yeah. some of the guys from my episode and that's, so I bought the socks and yeah. like, yeah. uh, I had, you know, I had like a little, I, I you know, I, I went all out and we had like Star Wars, you know, refreshments and my popcorn holder. And uh, we just kind of binged them all. And there you uh, go. I, I was super excited. <laughs> so I meant to ask you, um, uh, going back to dubbing for just a second, do you think that phenomenon of translating uh, not only the words of the script, but also the meaning? Uh, and also having to change the timing. Do you think that might be why um, there's this kind of popular sentiment that like the dubs are always worse than the subs? <laughs> uh, what do you what do you think about that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, obviously I, I am a dubber, so I, I, I try to kind of be a dubbing apologist and, you know, like, you know, try to try to defend it. But I mean, sure, like is, some of it will get lost. Um in translation, like, like anything, like, you know, when it's, when it's written in the, whatever form it's originally written in, you're going to have much more nuance and much more, you know, um, detail than, than if you're adapting it to a different language and trying to make the different language fit in. Um, and it's funny cause like, you know, my kids have, you know, when I, when I was doing a lot of dubbing, I still do some, a lot of dubbing now, but like when they were younger, I was on kind of some big dub shows and I would try to show it to them, but they were maybe a little too young to kind of, you know, be into the shows I was on. But then since then, 
they've really gotten into anime on their own and they're watching like Attack on Titan and Chainsaw Man and all these things. And so they're much more into subtitles than dubbing. Like, you're like, oh, dad, the dubs suck. And I'm like, come on, man. Like, <laughs> just please, you know, like, do you remember like what I do? Please, you know, so, this is my life. Yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, I think, you know, it's, uh, it's like anything else though. Like I, I, it is an art form. And I think that there are, um, I don't know that I would ever like just paint everything with a broad brush and say like all dubs stink and all subs are great. Like I, I think there's, you know, when, when it's done well, dubs can be really compelling and entertaining, you know, cause like I personally like to watch dubs better, not just cause I need work, but like, uh, like I, I, if I'm reading the the subtitles, sometimes I'm not paying as much attention to the, to the animation and I want to really be, you know, focused on the animation. So I just, as an English speaker, I prefer, you know, kind of hearing the English and then being able to really enjoy the animation instead of just, you know, peripherally watching it while I'm trying to read before it goes on to the next thing. So, um, so I think there's, there's pros and cons to both. I mean, obviously, um, the Japanese or whatever the native language is that the cartoons made in are, are amazing performers. And there's, you can obviously feel a lot of the intensity and the emotion, even if you're not understanding the the words and, and looking at the subtitles, but, uh, you know, I'm I'm probably biased, but I, I I think I think the potential for dubs to be done well exists, and I and I've been a part of some dubs that I thought were done pretty well, and uh, and you know a lot of it is if it's treated as this is just an extra on the DVD, you know that we're doing to kind of just you know allow it to sell in certain foreign language markets, and not a lot of attention is paid to it, not a lot of effort is put into it, then yeah, the dub's probably going to be bad. But if you've got someone who's really, you know, treating it as an art form and trying to make sure that we're, you know, matching the emotion and the intention of what the original language was, then I think it can be done really well. And it it can be actually really interesting and really cool, you know? Yeah. Or if you're lucky, it's the ghost stories dub. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) Nobody nobody in Japan is checking to make sure anything's going right. So you just make up whatever you want. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, go look that up if you don't know what I'm talking about. Um, all right, Carly, you want to take the next one? Yeah. So from dubbing to audiobooks, yes. um, Thrawn, the hot topic right now. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. So we had the Ascendancy trilogy uh-huh. um, with book three, Lesser Evil, being the most recent one that you've worked on. Yeah. Um, our boy Thrawn has been in quite a bit of stories, um, yes. you know, for the last uh, 30 years or so. Um, so with Lesser Evil, uh, we see a little different side of Thrawn, um, you know, in the story with Thras and how he's, you know, assigned to look over him. And they kind of become this bonded brother duo. Um, and we see a little different side of Thrawn. So how did you approach that? Yeah, it was really interesting. Like it, it was cool to kind of see him in in that situation and kind of see him not just be the brilliant tactician or the master general or the the, the combatant, but like really kind of uh, starting to value friendship and and I also like benefit from friendship and have you know like b- being being helped out in 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 ways that you know maybe he was not expecting or you know and. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it was, it was really cool. And, and, and so, so much of that is like, you know, Timothy Zahn is just such a great writer and such an amazing uh, storyteller. And, you know, is a, a lot of a lot of Thrawn is Zahn. <laughs> like it's like because he as an author thinks eight or nine steps ahead of the audience, you know, and, and like in, in the same way that Thrawn is eight or nine steps ahead of his enemies. Like, like Timothy has like got all these like things planned out and he's, he's foreshadowing things. You don't even realize like, you know, a lot of times when you read a book, you can kind of sell, Oh, this is what's going to happen next. Or, you know, Oh, I see what they're about to do, you know, and you kind of see what they're going to, but like, I feel like most of the time with the Thrawn books, it's like, it's not until the second time I'm reading through it where it's like, Oh, that's what was going on. Oh my goodness. Like that was from, that was from chapter one. No way. Like he, you know, planted that seed there, you know? And like, so it's just, uh, he's, he's just really masterful. So, so a lot of like, a lot of my work that I have to do is just, you know, enjoying, sit back, enjoy the ride. Cause he, he, he 
plants all those seeds and he puts all those beats in there. So it's, it's, there's not a lot for me to do because it's all right there on the page and it's, mm -hmm. it's really compelling. So did you try to like alter the voice a little bit um, in like certain interactions where we saw that different, that different side of the coin with him? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, I, you know, I think the, it's, it's like, it's like anyone, right? Like, you know, uh, our voices might change based on the situation we're in or, or, you know, like, you know, if, if you're in the heat of battle and shouting at someone versus if you're having an intimate conversation. And so it's more about like the, I, I try to focus more on the emotional beats and like mm -hmm. kind of the emotional intentions. And then that kind of, if I'm focused on the emotional intention or what's happening in the scene, that kind of alters the voice on its own. And like, I, I try to kind of keep the voice consistent and there's like a certain attributes that have to be the same throughout. But, you know, um, I did find myself, you know, maybe uh, speaking more gently or in a more warm way when we were having the scenes with Thras, and there, there was more of a vulnerability and a softness that was coming from the emotion of watching Thrawn discover friendship and watching Thrawn discover, you know, the value of, you know, this relationship and, and uh, you know, not, not just the utility of it, but, but you know, not like as like a, an asset that he can use or a pawn he can move on the chessboard, but like just genuinely, I care for this person, you know, and that was, that was a very interesting thing. Right. right. Do you, do you think something like that was surprising for thought for Thrawn? Like maybe even he didn't expect to feel that way. That's how I read it. And that's how I, you know, that's how I, it kind of struck me as, as we were going along. Yeah. So. Oh, cool. You, you really never, think of that side of him as a character but that's yeah totally plausible yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah so aside from Thrawn we have some other list of very interesting characters <laughs> um I'm probably gonna mispronounce these oh um, yeah <laughs> I, I, I'm a I'm more of a like physical book reader so oh, okay yeah I'm gonna pronounce them the way I think they were <laughs> but, okay um there was General Lyrius Nakire very good. Okay. okay. <laughs> Nakiri, um, yeah. <laughs> he's uh, the leader of the Kilji Illuminae, who yeah, yeah, is yeah. Um, also with Jixtus. Yes. Um, so they're trying to spread enlightenment and, you know, um, not in the nicest way. <laughs> but, right, right. <laughs> so how did you approach um, those voices? Um, yeah, I was going over it because I, you guys sent me some of these questions beforehand and I was like, oh, how did I approach that voice? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I had to kind of go back and look at my uh, notes and kind of re-listen to some of the references. But um, there was a line that I, I had written down and it said, um, like, once Jixus learned how to read the emotional responses reflected in the patterns of ripples and stretches that move through the dark orange Kilji skin, he would gain insight that went far deeper uh, than Nakiri's words. And so like, there was something about when I read that, I was like, oh, so there, there's the, you know, I, I loved, that was such a cool sci-fi, you know, uh, concept of that, you know, like you're part of the way that these beings communicate was like the ripples in the skin and as they, as they kind of stretch. And so I kind of latched on to that and I, and I said like, what if like the way that he talks, you can kind of, you know, hear him stretching as he speaks to Thrawn, you know, and like, and just like, mm -hmm. so I was trying to kind of almost do this like thing vocally where I was like stretching certain vowels or kind of stretching my neck as I spoke to kind of get like, to try to indicate in some way, maybe some of that, you know, rippling and, and stretching that the, was going on with the Kilji and, uh, so, so yeah, that was, and oftentimes that's what I'll do is I'll, I'll try to find some distinguishing feature or some characteristic that's described in the text and then kind of let that inform. I, I try to imagine like, how would that sound or what would, what, you know, what, how can that detail help me come up with something to make this character voice uh, be distinct from everybody else? So like Kilori? <laughs> yeah. Lori, yeah. uh, I guess I latched on for that one. I latched on to the idea that he, you know, that they're they're. I kind of saw them as the space, you know, uh, taxi guy, like a taxi driver, because he was like, you know, they needed these transports to take them different places in the chaos, and like so. I kind of like, you know, I had I had of a a bit of an alien taxi driver in my mind when I'm what I was thinking of him. So <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then there's, um, I mean, along with 
Jixtus, we have Yiv, the yes. benevolent. Um, yeah, they're yeah, yeah. The, the big baddies. Um, right. Pretty intimidating throughout the, you know, the trilogy. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So with those characters, like, what are you trying to convey with them? Because I feel like they're not like your conventional yeah. villains. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah. you never know what's going to come next. Right. Um. So for Yiv the Benevolent, um, I loved the idea of this kind of gregarious kind of almost like ringmaster and kind of, you know, like even in his name, like the benevolent, you know, like I'm, you know, like I'm welcome to my, you know, bountiful feast, ah, you know, yeah. like, and he was just kind of like very, very joyful and, and, and kind of, you know, charming, but there had to be that menace underneath, you know, and that, you know, like on the, on, on the surface, he's, you know, welcoming and come on in, but then there's the, there's the darkness to him. And there's that kind of, you know, that, you know, like in, intimidating presence about him. So I was trying to kind of marry those two things together um, with, with him. And, and so that's kind of what I was focused on with him. And then with Jixtus, um, it was, it was very mysterious. And I kept trying to like, search through the books to get more and more clues. And there, there was something about him being wrapped in the veils mm-hmm. and like, and, and gloves and kind of, you know, like um, it felt very dramatic to me <laughs> and like, kind of like, you know, that, that maybe there, you know, and I don't, I don't know that we have the whole story on him yet, even now, you know? Um, so I, I, I think my, in my mind, it's like, he does this very elaborate, dramatic, you know, presentation as a, as part of the way to kind of, you know, maybe disguise what's really go- going on or hide what's really going on. Um, and, and kind of, you know, a, a lot of the thing with the, like they, they always, it, it seemed like they were always using other people to do the dirty work and they were mm-hmm. kind of behind the scenes. So there was, you know, I, I kind of like this idea of almost like a puppet master or like a, you know, like very mysterious, you know, um, you know the, the Gris are here. And I'm, I wanted to talk very, mysteriously and like a, you know, very dark magician, you know, and, and kind of just, you know, uh, be very, very, um, creepy and, and kind of, you know, not, not sure what's behind that veil or what's going on with him. So I was, I was trying to lock into him and, and I, and I, I, he's, he's, I, I sometimes will pick, um, performances to kind of help me remember what I want to do. And, uh, there was this old movie that I loved as a kid called uh, Legend uh, with uh, t- Tom Cruise and uh, Tim Curry played this like devil character with these giant horns. And so Jixtus is very heavily influenced by Tim Curry from Legend. <laughs> so, <laughs> Yeah, I, I one of the fascinating things about Jixtus, I thought while reading it was he had this very like calm. Yes. Like, sod, but then, you know, with the. Uh, with Nakiri, you know, he would just kind of like say one little thing. You're like, this guy's going to explode. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah. Know? yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So very interesting characters. Yeah. Totally. Um, and, and again, then, that's all Timothy Zahn. Like, he's just so good at all that stuff. Um, I mean, and then rerouting back to Thrawn. Um, I mean, not too much of a spoiler, but um, the end of the book. Um, Thrawn loses a lot. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, he breaks some rules. A lot of people are not happy with him. And he basically loses status as a married adoptive in the Myth family. Mm-hmm. Um, he loses his position with the expansionary fleet. Um, I mean, how did you, ha- what was your reaction to that? I guess. I shouldn't have been surprised, but I was surprised because like I got so wrapped up in, you know, the story in, in those moments and kind of what was going on that I didn't realize that we were going to lead right up to the other trilogy that we did. And that, you know, where we saw Thrawn, you know, when he first started with the empire and that he was exiled and like, cause I, I got so wrapped up in what was happening with, you know, all the other characters and, and, you know, and, and, and the people attacking, you know, the Chiss home world and like, and them trying to solve that mystery that all was like, Oh, right. Wait a minute. This is, this is lining up exactly with that one. And, you know, so of course he has to, 
you know, like we, of course he should, you know, be exiled for some reason or, or, you know, and right. I guess in my mind, I filled in a, a backstory of that was all pretend or that was all him pretending to be exiled just so that uh, he could infiltrate the empire. But you know, this, it was kind of this weird, like two birds with one stone. Like it was a way to get him in that position, but there were people really plotting vengeance against him. And, you know, so, so it was kind of heartbreaking and watching him, you know, go before the the tribunal like that and, and, uh, and, and shocking it. Like, cause I just, uh, the, the story was so enthralling leading up to that. that it was like, Oh wait, this is going to line up exactly. Yeah. You know, and it's just like, Oh man, he's a genius. So like, uh, so it was, it was, it was, it was, yeah, I'm rambling now, but yeah, I was, I was, I was kind of shocked and, and very sad and, but been also very satisfied because I was like, this is so perfect. Like this, right. this, this makes so much sense. And like, yeah, it, it's, it's really cool. So in performing as Thrawn and all of these characters um, and concluding the Ascendancy trilogy, uh, what do you think are some, some important things that we've learned from the series that Timothy Zahn has given us? That's a good question. Um, well, I think, you know, I, I think what these, what, what both of the, the kind of recent trilogies have, have shown me is that um, Thrawn has a code. Like Thrawn has a, um, he, he's not just, um, or he's not at all like a, you know, a, a villain for villain's sake, really. Like, or, or even villain is like not really an accurate term in terms of how he's depicted in the books. Cause mm -hmm. he's, he's more, um, a pragmatist. Like he's, he's more like he, he will do what he, whatever needs to be done, uh, to, to kind of help his people. But he has a very, you know, a definitely like a moral code that guides him. And, and, you know, like he, um, it's almost like his ship is there's it's like a true meritocracy it's like it's like you know like you're 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 succeeding based on on the value of your ideas not like you know who you are or what you know family you're from or what you look like it's more about like you know the value of your ideas and whether or not you have good ideas or not and and uh and so you know and obviously we we've known forever what a brilliant tactician he is and and how smart he is, but I, but I think it will be interesting to see if they incorporate some of the qualities from these trilogies into the show. Because I think the way, you know, it's, even the way he was used in Rebels, um, you know, it it you you don't have as much time and the luxury to kind of get into his mindset and kind of the motivations behind what he's doing. So it's like more, you know, it it, it is more like he's the foil for. Ezra and Kanan and Hera and, you know, and, and kind of the, the opposition for them. So we only kind of get to know him as the opposition, yeah. but it'll be interesting if they can find ways to show these other sides of him now, you know, and if they don't, it's, it's, it's kind of cool to know, you know, this about him and kind of know this, you know, and then, you know, and, and then, cause he, there were even some things in, in these new trilogies that, you know, Timothy, Timothy was able to kind of, you know, explain some of the things that happened on Lothal, <laughs> you know, with, you know, uh, Price and all these other people um, and, and what, maybe what his motivations were that really made sense in the books, you know, and, and that made sense that this is why he was doing it and, and kind of, you know, so, so it'll, you know, it'll be interesting if, and I know that like there's some interviews I read that, you know, uh, Dave Filoni and Timothy Zahn have been talking and, and you know, collaborating. So it's going to be really, really interesting. But I, but I think that's the, one of the things that's fascinating about him is, is that knowing that he you know, um, really is, is, is just all about the good idea and not about, you know, the politics of things. And even just that he kind of despises politics, you know, <laughs> and like, you know, and just, you know, uh, really wants to kind of, you know, get to know people and he's a respecter of, of these different things. And so it'll be definitely interesting to see how much of that carries over or how much of that is just kind of you know, stuff that we'll know beneath the surface, but you know, it'll, it'll, it'll be really interesting to see how that works out. Yeah, for sure. What was your reaction? Uh, when you, when they announced Lars? Oh, I was <laughs> over the moon. I was so happy. Yeah. Cause like, <laughs> like it was, it was, it was multi uh, leveled because on, on the one hand, like I love him and rebels so much. So I really, I, I was really hoping it would be him. So, you know, I was excited for that. I'm just excited that, 
Thrawn is going to exist in live action. Like that's just going to be amazing. But then selfishly, if I ever get to do more Thrawn books, I was like, okay, I don't have to change the voice again. You know, <laughs> cause it's like, cause if they got somebody yeah. else, it'd be like, well, now do I have to do like Pierce Bronson in order? Or do I have to do, you know, like <laughs> uh Benedict Cumberbatch or somebody, you know? So like, uh, it was, uh, it, it was kind of like a, <laughs> yeah. I think I had sent you when they announced it um, that like meme where it's like, oh, I would oh, yeah. I asked for the real Thrawn. Yeah, the, the yeah. Real Thrawn. <laughs> so, but fun, little funny story about that. I thought that was just like a meme that was just floating around. My boyfriend made that. <laughs> oh no way! Because he like he loves your work with all the audio books. Oh, that's cool. And he's like, yeah, I made that. I was like, oh, I just shared that with you. <laughs> <laughs> that was super fun. That's amazing. I tell him thank you. <laughs> yeah, because I, I remember seeing that meme in the wild. Uh, like, I don't, I don't think it came up in our group chat, but I, I know exactly which one. <laughs> That was funny. like wildfire. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you're, you know, you do such a great job and, uh, you know, you uh, really bring Thrawn to life. And uh, it's just really cool to see, um, uh, you know, going from the books to the yeah, animation. Yeah. And now we're going to get uh, live action. So, yeah, it's very I can't exciting. wait. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. But yeah, it's going to be so great. Like, I, I, and I, yeah, it's going to be so good. So good. Well, let's talk about uh, briefly the Princess and the Scoundrel. Oh yeah, uh, by Beth Revis. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so this is a fun way to present an audiobook with. Uh, oh goodness, Saskia Marlv Saskia Marleveld. Yes, very good. Cool. Nice. <laughs> it's <laughs> took me um, like four or five times to get. <laughs> yeah. Uh, brief side tangent i work as an audio engineer and oh. one of the things i've had to do this week was record a narrator reading first chronicles and oh, wow if you know anything about that it's yeah among men among other things a long long list of ancient near eastern names right <laughs> all with like different pronunciations like oh man the descendants of etam were jezreel ishma idbash their sister has a little pony whoa Penuel, the father of gidor and Ezer, the father of husha and it's that for hours upon hours. Wow. I think by hour five, like both of our brains were like too right. paced. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> I I can imagine that's much the same with Star Wars names. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, um, so with Saskia, uh, did you record separately or did you have an opportunity to be in the same room? So we did record separately for most of the book. Um, and I think that was probably a budget and efficiency thing. Uh, and, and also the idea that like, cause what, what, what Beth Revis did when she wrote it was, um, you know, the, the chapters alternate. So like one chapter is from Han's point of view and then the next chapter is from Leia's point of view. So like, um, it would have been really cool if we were in this, you know, same scenes back and forth that would have been a lot of fun but but i think the decision was is we'll we'll tell this chapter purely from this narrator's point of view uh except kevin thompson who directs uh most of the star wars audiobooks and does an amazing job with that he had the idea no, that the, uh, no actually although it is <laughs> interesting because uh the first ever cartoon i ever got was daria and i played a character on that show called kevin thompson and kevin oh, was wow. directing a show called spy something uh also for mtv and he we happened to be at sync sound at the same time uh but huh. this is years before we ever worked on star wars again you know so it was great <laughs> yeah so um but uh kevin had the idea for the last oh maybe i shouldn't say this but there's a surprise in the last okay. chapter <laughs> I'm, I'm reading it, so, yeah <laughs> okay there's, there's a surprise in the last chapter that uh in the audio there's a surprise in the last chapter of the audiobook that might be a fun surprise for everybody. Uh, that's really cool. So, okay. So, besides the surprise ending, yes. um, what is your kind of elevator pitch to listeners to check this book out? Um, I think if you love, you know, the original trilogy, if you love the banter between Han and Leia, if you love romance, if you love the adventure, you'll you'll love this book. Like it's 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 a, uh, it definitely feels like a spiritual sequel to return of the Jedi and kind of, you know, like it, it, uh, it, it, it kind of picks up like right after that. It's like, you know, um, kind of the celebration on Endor, and then we go off to the races. And, and so, uh, 
it's super fun and it's I, I really enjoyed it. And then just as a bonus bonus, if if all that stuff doesn't get you, uh, if you're a fan of you know Disney parks. And if you're curious about the Galactic Star Cruiser and the Halcyon, you know, they're, it's not a spoiler, but the, it's on the cover and they, in the promotion, but they, they basically are gifted a honeymoon on the Halcyon. And like you, there's all these kind of descriptions on things that are happening in their adventure that, you know, I got to go on the Star Cruiser. I planned a vacation a while ago and and we decided to go on it. And before I knew I did the book, but it was so much fun because I read the book before going and it was like, this is the thing where Han and Leia, and, you know, and like they, they were yeah. here and they, you know, and they're they referencing like these different corners of the ship. And I was like, that's in the book and that's in the book, you know? So like, so if you're going, it's fun for that. And if you never get to go, it's, you, you'll kind of get to experience it in some way through, through their story. So it's, uh, so I think it's great. I think it's really well done. And, and, and Beth like really nails kind of the, the, the banter that they have. And I, and I feel like the, the kind of, you know, the, the bickering that we love, you know, seeing Harrison Ford and Carrie Fisher do like she really captures that. And I, I think it's really well done. So basically, this book is for anybody who's ever seen those matching tattoos of I love you and I know. <laughs> yes, exactly. I thought about getting them. Yes, okay. yes, yes. Yeah, <laughs> that's a much better pitch than what I just did. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Awesome. Uh, skipping ahead a little bit. Um, you had a revisit with some Legends material. Yeah. With- the Back to War yes. um, by Michael Stackpole. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. Ah, oh, it was so cool. Um, it was it was really fun to kind of get back uh, and, and do those and do do the kind of full unabridged version, you know, because um, they, they they had had audiobooks when they first came out, but they were they were heavily abridged, and so it was so cool to kind of get to do that. And uh, you know, it was it was really weird, like because this was kind of come we recorded them kind of coming out of a lot of the covid lockdowns and and all this stuff and there's there's some major um you know story points in there that deal with a virus that the empire releases and it's like it's crazy oops how like prescient some of that stuff was because it's like you know there's so many parallels that these you know these were written like you know what was it 20 years ago or something like that and like there's so many things that like you know, in terms of like, you know, some of the social up, upheaval and, uh, and and even like some kind of, you know, interesting metaphors between xenophobia and, and, and race, racism and things like that. And and how, you know, how the, the, the virus affects people and, and people's trust of institutions and, and just all this mm-hmm. stuff. I was like, holy cow, like, when did he write this? You know, because there's just like <laughs> so much stuff lined up. Um, and then it's just like the X-Wing action is just, it, it felt like Top Gun in space. Like it was just like, you know, like this, like it, he was so great at like writing kind of, you know, the fighter pilot mindset and and kind of, you know, being in that squadron and in the, you know, the space battles and, you know, just, you just leaps off the page and just, you know, you can totally see this happening in your mind. And uh, so it was, it was really fun. I really enjoyed getting to do those. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm reminded of, uh, a pet peeve that I have, um, Uh-oh. cause people will like, you mentioned, uh, stories like that kind of being ahead of their time or uh-huh. like, uh, predicting the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm thinking of, uh, movies like they live, which, mm. um, you know, it's dated in some ways, but also like really relevant as far as like the haves and the have nots. Right. And, right. Um, uh, me- media control. And it's like man, how could you write this like back in the 1980s? And it's like, nothing is like ahead of its time. It's <laughs> yeah, just yeah. like, nothing's changed. <laughs> right, right, right. Why People it, weren't like, aware of it when it was happening back then, <laughs> you know, or like, yeah. 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 <laughs> um, but yeah, that that sounds like a fun read, especially because like, I'm a I'm a Star Fox nerd. Oh, cool. Um, grew, grew up playing that. And uh, so I have a soft spot in my heart for like dog fights. And yeah. Um, Star Wars style kind of aerial combat. So it's awesome. Maybe check that out. Yeah, you really should. They're they're really fun. Uh, we're running a bit short on time, so I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. Um, I do want to touch on the High Republic stuff you've worked on. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there's the High Republic Convergence, uh, which is um, a novel by Zareda Cordova. Mm-hmm. Uh, right. And it's part of like the phase two of the multimedia project. Yeah. 
Uh, and then, so you read for that. You were also read for High Republic, the Battle of Jeddah, which came out on January 4th. Yeah. So uh, let's let's talk about that a bit, because most of your work, you're doing like everything. You're narrating, yeah. you're doing all the character voices. This one is different because you're working with other voice actors. What yeah. was that process like in comparison to what you normally do? Um, it's 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 really fun. Like I, um, you know, that but both are cool for different reasons. Like it's it's in the same way that like it's fun to see a play, but it's also fun to see a one person show because it's like oh wow, what are they? You know, so like they're just they're they're great for different reasons. You know, so um, uh the on on Battle of Jeddah, on on a, a lot of the other multicast ones, I actually got to do scenes like with other actors, and like whenever that happens, it's such a treat because you it just changes the entire performance when you have a partner to work out work off of and just kind of bounce things off of because inevitably they're gonna deliver a line in a way that you would not have delivered it, and that inspires and affects you and so then you kind of respond to that and then there's this really cool like kind of tennis match going on and so i I love anytime we get to do that and it's 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 a much richer deeper experience um and and it's a lot of fun you know so um for for battle of jetta i i was mainly kind of you know in the in the bar uh i was doing this uh bartender it's like this like kind of like alien uh bartender kooky guy um and so i i i don't i'll make sure i'm not lying but I, i'm pretty sure for battle of jedi i did not get to do any scenes with any of the other actors like i did for afro or dooku or um uh some of the other ones um so i i missed out on that experience but i i, I listened to that one and it was it was it's always fun like listening to all everybody coming together and the whole thing you know so uh so I I really love it. I love both experiences. Like I love getting to tell a story and trying to the challenge of trying to kind of inhabit all the characters in the book. But I also love getting to play with other performers and kind of, you know, getting to be a part of that team that brings something together like that. So both are very rewarding. Awesome. Fantastic. Um, OK, with the time that we have left, uh, I'd like to shift focus to look into the future. Uh, I'm looking ahead at uh, what's coming up on uh, Disney Plus, all things Star Wars, hey. um, which moving to the future, we, I can feel the crosshairs of Disney's lawyers <laughs> uh, <laughs> closing in on us. I so, know nothing, so uh, <laughs> we're safe. Lo- loose lips sink ships. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, we do have a ton of shows coming up. We've got. Um, we had uh, Book of Boba Fett, Moon Knight, Obi Wan Kenobi, uh, She Hulk, Andor. Uh, we had Bad Batch. We had Mandalorian. Yeah. Uh, and now we're looking ahead at the Acolyte, Ahsoka. Yeah. Yes. Um, I mean, what? Looking back and looking ahead, what are some of the common themes or like threads running between these shows that you've come to appreciate? Mm. Um. Well, I love, I guess, like, uh, I love what, you know, through, like, Book of Boba or, or Andor um, and even Mando and, and Bad Batch. Like, it, do, it does seem like they, they are kind of constantly playing with this theme of found family and, like, you know, um, you know your, your family kind of being, like, when you find your tribe or when you find your kind of, you know, group that's... Uh, that's with with you and loyal to you and taking care of you and just how how precious that is and how worthy of protection that is and how we need to fight for that and to protect that and so i i always love those themes and resonate very strongly with those themes and uh i want to try to kind of embody that in my own life so i i'm I'm very i find all of that super inspirational um so yeah and i and i and i imagine we'll we'll get a lot of that in Ahsoka and Skeleton Crew and uh um so yeah I and I'm I'm I cannot wait for Ahsoka like I'm so psyched that it's August and like you know it's so soon like I'm I uh cuz I really I Rebels is probably my favorite cartoon uh of the animation stuff like I I loved Clone Wars I loved all of the stuff but like I really connected with Rebels so 
seeing so much of that cast in live action and kind of, you know, I'm assuming the story is going to be about trying to find Ezra. Maybe I'm wrong, but, uh, and, and, and maybe like, it's like, it looks like it's going to be, I don't know anything. So this is just me speculating, but like, it looks like it's going to be finding Ezra, but maybe marrying that with, you know, heir to the empire. And like in that, which is such an interesting, like how, like, like seeing how those two things could overlap. And, and, uh, and then I have no idea how these, like, what the, who these Sith people are, what what their deal is, or if they are Sith or not. Like I'm like, what is going on? So like, I, I I'm super excited about that show. I think it's gonna be great. Yeah. Uh, why do you think that theme of found family seems to like resonate or have found such a large audience? I mean, I I think it's probably because it's the story of all of us like it's the story like you know you you have your family that you're you're born into um and that's precious and that's that's important and valuable but then part of kind of your own personal hero's journey and kind of growing up and discovering well who am i and what's my place in the world like as you mature you have to go out and find people that you align with and find people that you do you know you uh that support you and that you want to support and that are kind of in the battle for good and evil with. And, you know, so I I think, I think there's something in that that all of us can relate to on some level. Like we all, you know, whether it's like when you're going into high school or college or starting your career, it's like all of us are in those situations where we're kind of alone. And then we've got to, we've got to find our people. We've got to find that group, you know? And, And so I think that's something, it's a very universal story and a very important story. Like, I think we all need to kind of, you know, find ways to be that for each other. We need to find ways to be family to each other. And uh, so I think it's super inspiring and super universal. I can imagine has some added poignance to you at this time of life. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) My crew is leaving me. Ah! (laughs) Yeah, But there's always more adventures to be had. Yeah, exactly. All right. Carla, you got any any final questions before we move on? Uh, I just want to say that I love watching your reaction videos to ah, things. Yeah. Like it just like I'm excited and then just watching your reactions makes me even more excited and happy. Oh, so you. like if anyone's <laughs> never seen Mark's uh, reaction videos to, you know, like Mando episodes of trailers, oh, it's just a, it's a treat. I love it. <laughs> oh, thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> It used to be a fun thing. Uh, I, I like the very first one I did was for Force Awakens and my kids were really little and I was so excited. And then I just started kind of keep doing them, you know, and we would do like Marvel and Star Wars and they've kind of, you know, matured past it and they, they, they kind of don't like being on camera anymore and they don't want, yeah. you know, uh, <laughs> but, but I, so I, but I, I, I still get excited about stuff. So it's, it's, it's not as exciting because my kids aren't, my family's not there as much anymore, but, uh, but it's good to hear that, that it brings some joy to you. <laughs> awesome. Well, uh, Mark, where can people follow you? Oh, yeah. Uh, I am Captain Ehud Mark Thompson VO. So it's like uh, I can I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Twitter. Um, and like I said, I'm starting to kind of do more convention appearances. So it's. Uh, it would be great if you follow because then I can I, I tend to update where I'm going to be on on those platforms. So if, if you ever want to come meet me sometime or say hi, I'd love I'd love to hear from you uh, at any of those events. Awesome. Any upcoming appearances? I've got a bunch coming up this summer. Um, I am trying to remember. I think I should have had this ready to go. I'm sorry. I, I, I know like uh, <laughs> uh, I think in. In June, I might end of June. I might be in San Antonio. Uh, I'm going to be in Virginia in July, um, and then yeah, there's there's a couple other places in the works. Um, I, I'm going to be in Ocala, Florida, over also in July. So I'll, I'll be kind of popping all over the place. So awesome, nice. Yeah. All right. So, Mark, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. It's been a pleasure. And uh, we'll, we're, we're still working on the commemorative plates, but uh, <laughs> surely by the next time that you're around, they'll be ready to go. I look forward to it. Thanks for having me. It was a lot of fun. I love talking with you guys. Of course. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. It's time for 
News of the Week. And now, the Star Wars News of the Week. All right, Carla, take it away. Okay. So, first up, I have an article from theguardian.com. Star Wars Jedi Survivor Review, the best Star Wars game in 20 years. That's, that's, That's quite a statement. Uh, <laughs> that is high praise. Yeah. Um, so uh, the that, res- that includes that might include Knights of the Old Republic because that was like 2003 was 2002 oh, something like that. Yeah. So uh, yeah, certainly includes the original Battlefront and Battlefront Two. That's like 2005, I think. Yeah. Um. So. Woo. Yeah. So uh, I mean, I don't want to go through. It looks like there's kind of some some spoilers here. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I'm <laughs> not scrolling down too much. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, okay, wait a uh, minute. I don't want to read this. <laughs> but maybe, maybe like the first like two paragraphs. Um. Yeah. So basically, um, they are just praising um everything about this game. The opening sequence is spellbinding. Uh, is the word Whoa. that they use. Um, we see, a, you know, a plethora of um, different locations, uh, such as Coruscant. Um, I guess uh, we'll be um, on a luxury space yacht. There's some uh, thrill rides. Uh, again, I don't want to be too like spoilery here, um, but yeah. it's everything you want from a Star Wars adventure and blockbuster video game. Visually spectacular, mechanically sophisticated, and ret- right. Why can't I say this word? Riotously. Riotously. Thank you. Riotously entertaining. Um, yeah. So obviously, Jedi Fallen Order was a huge hit, and now with the sequel game coming um the enthralling follow-up is a huge improvement it is a master class in cinematic action but its eclectic Whoa. mixture of mechanics is also much more elegantly implemented mm. yeah um the result is the best star wars game in 20 years as compelling in the hands as it is magnificent on the screen so yeah, they are uh they're just thrown out there that it's can't be missed. So um Yeah. Oh wow. Uh, I, I've heard their hmm? No, I was just gonna I the the last one of the last sentences in the article is meanwhile its biggest moments rival anything games like God of War or Elden Ring can throw at you. So Whoa. That's yeah. That is high Those praise. are some big names. So, <laughs> yeah, um, I've heard there is currently like some performance issues on like the PC version. Okay. So you might want to wait a little bit for like any like bug patches and stuff like that. But who? Mine ships tomorrow. I might have to find a way to buy this. <laughs> yeah. Oh, boy. Yeah. I mean, again, I don't want to like go through any spoilery stuff so that we can all enjoy the game yeah. and experience it for the first time. Um, but yeah, it looks, it looks good. Very exciting stuff. Yeah. So, um, for me, it's, it's not a matter of like, if I'm going to play this game, it's just when. Yeah. Oh yeah. So for sure. I, I'm, I'm hoping I don't take five years. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well who knows it, it looks like it's improved in every way so maybe it's like easier to pick up i mean who hey uh, if those hollow maps are still a thing i'm lost <laughs> i'm lost from the get-go my brain just can't yeah. visually spatially figure that out so story mode it is people <laughs> all right uh next screenramp.com uh this article says Star Wars finally confirms timeline of Kylo Ren's origin and Luke's exile. Okay. Um, so there's a new Star Wars book, uh, which apparently confirms what I 
just said. Um, it, uh, it confirms the timeline of events surrounding Ben Solo's fall of the dark side and Luke Skywalker's subsequent exile in the sequel trilogy. Uh, as a result of Luke's failure to support Ben during his struggles with the dark side, the rise of Kylo Ren massively defined the galaxy's future prior to the events of The Force Awakens. Um, so the book is Star Wars Timelines from Kristen Baver, Jason Fry, and Cole Horan, Amy Rickow, and Clayton Sandal. Um, it's a comprehensive reference guide for the Star Wars continuity. So this includes events taking place between the original and sequel trilogies. And specifically, they, I guess, show you uh, where Ben Solo ultimately falls to the dark side. And when Luke says, peace out, I give up. Uh, mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, and if you guys haven't checked out the cover of this book and everything, I mean, it looks very nice. It's one of those coffee table books. So if you're into that. Uh, it seems like it's a must have. Um, but just to give a little like sneak peek, uh, according to this timelines book, 28 ABY after the Battle of Yavin was a major year in which several significant events took place. However, they all stemmed from the inciting incident when the truth about Leia Organa as why do I get it? I just got an Apple TV. Ad. <laughs> Sorry. Um, wow. When, uh, so when the truth about Leia Organa as Darth Vader's daughter was publicly exposed, uh, which connects to Claudia Gray's novel Bloodline, and if you haven't read that one, I highly recommend. It's a great one. Um, so this was the end of her political career with the New Republic, uh, kind of where. She broke off and formed her little resistance group. Um, but yeah, so it seems like they go into more detail in the book about exactly how this all happens and the consequences of all of these happenings. So if you're into that kind of a thing, I would say go pick it up. Looks pretty cool. Yeah. Um, what else we got? And then finally, we have, and people, can I just tell you, when I heard this, I was shocked. I was legitimately, genuinely right. shocked because I thought that this had already happened some quite some time ago. Um, so shocked and a little, a little annoyed and upset <laughs> that it's happening right now. But um, Star Wars icon Carrie Fisher will uh, receive a Hollywood Walk of Fame star on May 4th, Star Wars Day, which is very fitting. Um, her daughter, Billy Lord, will accept the star on her mother's behalf. Um, so, yeah, this, I, I mean, I don't know. I was shocked because I thought she already had a star. And why she has it uh, yeah. until this point, it, it kind of like irks me. <laughs> like, I'm actually genuinely upset yeah. about it. <laughs> yeah, not only because of like her on screen roles, but all the work that she's done with like script doctoring. Mm -hmm. Like, come on. And she's just, uh, she's just an icon in so many ways, you know? It, yeah. Like, I'm kind of sad that this is happening and she's not around to see this, you know? Um, yeah, but I'm sure Billy will do her mother very proud um, in accepting and honoring her legacy and her work. Um, yeah, gone too soon, Carrie. We miss her all the time. So, mm -hmm. but um, it'll be happening on May 4th, which is pretty cool. So, glad that they're at least uh, picking the appropriate date for it. Yeah. Uh, and it looks like Long two, overdue, but she'll be close to um, she'll be close to Mark's and across the street from her mother's star, 
Debbie Reynolds. Okay. Yeah, yeah. long overdue, but glad it's finally happening. Yes, yes. Uh, and I believe that is all the news that I have for this week. All right. That means it's time for Cantina Chat. All right, the part of the show where we talk about everything geeky and weird going on with our lives. Carla, what's been going on with you? Oh, um, I mean, nothing too crazy. I am prepping for my voyage to uh, Batu next week. We'll be going to Disney for May 4th. Nice. Um, so I'm very excited about that. I have to start packing now because it stresses me out. <laughs> um are you uh a bit by bit packer or an all at once i have to do it bit by bit because i can't i can't be a day of packer because i'm very indecisive with what i want to wear and i overpack too like all the time without fail i'm the worst Uh, (laughs) so um but i think it helps this time around because it is star wars day and we kind of want to do some special like on theme stuff and we have some legion gear that we want to wear so that'll help me eliminate uh some wardrobe choices but uh <laughs> but yeah we're, yeah we're super excited i can't wait it's gonna be a fun time um and then Does obviously Disney still have that policy where like adults can't dress up in costume so i always get it confused one of them is more lenient than the other. Um, Disneyland versus Disney World. I want to say Disneyland because when we were in Anaheim for celebration, um, they had like a special Star Wars night during the same, you know, the, you know, it was coincided with the convention. And I just went in yeah. my general Leia, like my briefing room costume and they let me in like you can't bring any um you can bring lightsabers but you can't bring any like prop blasters and uh weapons and stuff like that um gotcha but yeah they let me in uh a friend of mine was dressed up as lando they let him in so i don't know if it depends on like if there's a special event um Hmm. i know with the star cruiser they heavily encourage cosplay I just don't think you can wear like I don't think you're allowed to dress as characters that are in the park. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I think if you showed up in like full on Ray costume, they might not let you. I don't know. Like, <laughs> yeah. Um. So I think that's why a lot of people do the bounding because you can kind of throw something together that's not the exact costume but it has elements of it um that's what bounding is yeah yeah so like i have um i'm planning to wear i bought it from ashley Eckstein's line of clothing um Mm -hmm. she made this uh it's a dress that has the pattern of the cloud city costume that i'm currently embroidering uh (laughs) So I'm like, oh, like maybe I'll wear that one of the days. So it's like elements of costumes, but it's not the costume itself. But I think I think with the Star Cruiser, it's a little bit more encouraged that you can wear like more cosplay looking things Um, because uh, Justin and Naomi, um, they've like created their own characters and put together their own ensemble of costumes oh, um uh, so yeah but i don't know yeah i forget which one is like more strict than the other so that makes sense yeah um and then obviously excited for jedi survivor um so i'm looking mm-hmm. forward to playing that and then i potentially may have a campaign to be playing soon hopefully uh (laughs) i'm really excited yeah um yeah we're hoping to get it going maybe sometime later on in may um but i've been itching itching to play 
And I actually found this really cool dice set. So I was like, I'm going to play that. Uh, yeah, so I have to start researching into a character that I want to play. And it's just been like fitting because I'm like still in my critical role binge. So I'm loving it. I'm very excited. Oh, I'm so happy for you. Yeah. You'll have to let us know how it goes. Definitely. Uh, but yeah, that's pretty much it for me. How how are things right. with you? Well, since you asked, um, uh, still working with uh, Charles from Conversations, who says hi, by the way. Um, he's the hey. kind of co-DM with the Red Five Tavern. Uh, so we're in the middle of like a two week break. Uh, we're working on some stuff behind the scenes and ready to uh, co DM the game together. So that's going to be fun. Um, not this Saturday, but the following one is the, the, the big, uh, with my star Wars game, the big boss fight with Revan. Ooh. So I'm a little worried about that. <laughs> um, just in, in a good way. It's, it's just me trying to make sure that it's fun for everyone and trying not to overthink it. Um, but yeah, it's probably going to be a good time. Um, then besides that, I mean, I have been, I've been playing a lot of fallout new Vegas when I have a chance. Um, which is like a old, like, uh, like apocalyptic Western, uh, kind of RPG game. And I've played through like all of the standard game content. Uh, and I just played through the Dead Money DLC, which I've never played before, but it kind of sucks. Um, it, it's it's not great. It's um, basically like, hey, why don't we do Resident Evil in our Fallout game? Um, and the way I, I would describe it is like, it's as if like uh, somebody running a tabletop game just got a visit from the Good Idea Fairy, <laughs> and they're like, oh yeah, why don't we um you know, gas you. So you fall unconscious, you wake up, you have like a bomb collar around your neck. And unless you do what, uh, exactly what this guy says, he's going to blow it up. <laughs> and there's like other people they have to work with on this heist. And they're all like these crazy characters in one way or another. And if you kill any of them, you all blow up. If you do anything besides what I tell you, you all blow up. Um, and also there's this like thick red gas cloud that if you, spend too much time into it you die and then you blow up um and there's also these like weirdo people uh who are like trying to hunt you down in there uh it's like all these oh and by the way like all your stuff that you've spent the entire game getting is gone now you just have to like scrounge and scavenge for everything that you need it's like yikes <laughs> it sounded good on paper um like if, if that's how the game started, I'd be like, OK, but, you know, I, I've played like, I don't know, 40 hours on this playthrough already. Um, and like just all my stuff is gone and like I can't leave the area. And I'm like, oh, this is annoying. Um, so I, I finished it and there's a lot to like about it, but there's a lot of really annoying design decisions that, again, probably sounded good on paper. Um, so I'm glad that's done and I can move on to the next DLC. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's been taking up my free time. Uh, Todd wrote in. He said uh, he's been playing the Resident Evil 4 remake. Uh, I assume he likes that because uh, he put it on there. But he also <laughs> put a little note for Jedi Survivor. Sounds like he's looking forward to that. And I just realized I'm getting paid tomorrow. <gasps> Me so, too. Maybe... Maybe I could be sick tomorrow. We'll see. Little hooky doesn't hurt anybody. <laughs> yeah, but uh, uh, yeah, that's that's about all I've got, uh, which means that's the end of the episode. So thanks again for listening to another episode of WSTR Galactic Public Access. You can find us on the socials: uh, Heather at Hawk Awesome, Carla at Carla Marie Giac, Todd at Tizad. Myself at Aaron Julian, and we are part of the Red Five Network, a wonderful network of Star Wars podcasts. Um, 
Uh, we want to hear from you. So please comment, tweet, rate us on Apple Podcasts. If you give us a five star rating, we'll throw in some swag. You can catch our entire back catalog of episodes at podcast.wsdrmedia.com. We got merch over at store.wsdrmedia.com. And we are on Patreon, patreon.com slash wsdrmedia. Go check it out. Uh, thanks, everybody, for hanging out with us in the YouTube chat. Uh, you can check us out at livestream.wsdrmedia.com. That will shoot you through the hyperspace lanes to our YouTube page where you can subscribe, ring the bell so you don't miss any streams. If you have any ideas for a show or you would love us to interview someone, please drop us an email at mailbox at wsdrmedia.com or leave us a voicemail at 630-557-WSDR. That's 630-557-9787. Next week, it is going to be May the 4th. And (laughs) we got a lot on the docket. I don't want to spoil any of it right now. Just you won't want to miss that. So please go check it out. Uh, Okay, Carla. There's only one way to end this show. Now Now this this is is podcasting. podcasting. Thank you, Mark. Gotta have you on soon. Get you those commemorative plates. He's he's the best. We love him. (laughs) All right.